Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored, on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. It is Monday, January the 7th, 2019. It is the first of Shvat 5779, Rosh Chodesh. For Jews around the world, Rosh Chodesh Shvat. Hope you're doing well in your part of the world. Get in touch with me during the week, Josh at thelandofisrael.com. On Facebook, it's Joshua Haston, and on Twitter at Josh Haston. Um, we have a very special show for you here today. We're going to get to our guest here in just a second, give you a little bit of background. U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton was in Israel uh, arriving on Saturday night. I think he, he may still be here. I'm not exactly sure. I know he was running around yesterday and uh, to discuss Bolton's trip here to Israel is Ambassador Yoram Edinger, former Consul General of the Southwest United States, Minister for Congressional Affairs at the Israeli Embassy in Washington, and expert on Israeli-U.S. relations. He's been a guest on the show before. Ambassador Edinger, it's an honor to have you back on the program. It's my honor. Thank you very much. So according to the Times of Israel, the White House sent U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton here to the region because of Israeli concerns about U.S. President Donald Trump's decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Syria. What is your take on, number one, the fact that the U.S. is pulling out of Syria? Number two, uh, John Bolton's visit here to the region yesterday. Well, it's, it's too early to call on the announcement made about uh, pulling the U.S. troops out of Syria, it's too early because uh, I don't know yet what are the current and the next steps taken by the U.S. uh, in face of the Ayatollahs in Iran, in face of uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, in face of bolstering the Hashemites in uh, Jordan, uh, all of which, all of which, uh, would provide us a more realistic account of the significance of the pullout of the U.S. troops, which we already heard uh, has been delayed, maybe slightly, maybe in a long uh, term. Uh, one significant element which I would like to emphasize is it's an error, it's a mistake to refer to the U.S. potential pullout of Syria as if it has a significant impact on Israel's national security. Israel does not, Israel does not need U.S. troops in Syria to sustain its own national security. Israel does not need U.S. active personnel military support to sustain its own national security. The major repercussion would be if indeed there is a pullout for the Hashemite regime in Jordan, for the pro-U.S. Arab regimes in the Persian Gulf, for the future state of Syria and Lebanon, but Israel can take care of its own uh, needs. When it comes to John Bolton, uh, what I would like to remind people who may not be aware that uh, John Bolton, whom I have known for almost 30 years, he was the chief leader behind the move to repeal Zionism, racism from the books of the UN. It was a 1991 initiative uh, led by uh, John Bolton. He was then assistant uh, uh, secretary of state for international organizations. And he did that, although his direct boss, Jim Baker, was not exactly uh, enamored with the, uh, with the idea. But that initiative reflects the core of uh, Ambassador John Bolton's, or National Security Advisor John Bolton's worldview as far as Israel, as far as the Jewish state, as far as U.S.-Israel relations. Yeah, I, I know over the years, I think Bolton has proven to be a true ally and friend of the state of Israel. I think that goes without saying. Uh, yesterday, the, the prime minister called on the U.S. in a meeting with John Bolton, publicly called on the U.S. to officially, once and for all, recognize the Golan Heights as part of the state of Israel. 
Do you believe that President Trump perhaps will listen to our prime minister after yesterday's remarks directly to Bolton? I mean, I would guess that John Bolton realizes that it's essential for the Golan to remain part of Israel. But do you think that will have an impact on future U.S. policies vis-a-vis uh, Israel controlling the Golan? Well, it's, it's possible, and it coincides and possibly also was generated by a move to that effect on Capitol Hill. There is a move by some significant legislators to uh, uh, urge the U.S. administration to recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. However, I have a slight problem with that because certainly the Golan Heights is very critical for U.S. national security. But uh, Judea and Samaria, the mountain ridges of Judea, Samaria, they are the Golan Heights of Jerusalem. They are the Golan Heights of Tel Aviv. They are the Golan Heights of the entire coastal plain of Israel. They, go, they are the Golan Heights of Ben Gurion Airport. They are the Golan Heights of uh, Freeway uh, 6. So how can one uh, refer to a potential recognition of Israel's sovereignty on the Golan Heights without reckoning that uh, much more important for Israel happens to be the mountain ridges of Judea and Samaria. And last and not least, Israel's control of the Golan Heights is critical for America's interests. And it's time that we, at least in Israel, realize that the U.S. does conduct its affairs based on its own interests, not somebody else's interests. If Israel would not be on the Golan Heights back in 1970, there would not be today a Hashemite regime in Jordan. The only reason that the Hashemite regime in Jordan escaped annihilation back in September 1970, when the Syrian military invaded Jordan, when the Palestinians rebelled, uh, subverted, the Hashemite regime in Jordan, the only reason was Israeli deployment of its own forces to the joint Israel-Syria-Jordanian uh, frontier, which means the Golan Heights, and within 48 hours, without shooting a single bullet, the Syrian military withdrew back to, uh, to Syria. For Israel to withdraw from the Golan Heights would undermine America's national security in the Middle East, and certainly an Israeli withdrawal from the mountain ridges of the Golan Heights would doom to oblivion the Hashemite regime that is going to, that would cause a ripple effect into Saudi Arabia, into the entire Persian Gulf, would be a great prize for the Ayatollahs, for Russia, for the Muslim Brotherhood, a major, major blow to America's national security interests. It's amazing what you said before, and I never thought of it like this. You said uh, Judea and Samaria is the Golan Heights of Israel's coastal plain, the airport, the greater Tel Aviv area. That That is a unique quote, so I thank you for that. That's I've never thought of it like that, but you're exactly right, no doubt. Uh, speaking of U.S. interests, because President Trump has made it clear that he has the interests of the American people in mind, uh, America first, that's one of his slogans. It has been since he was elected. Um, so it was revealed, uh, I believe, yesterday or the day before that the uh, Trump uh, team, Team Trump has decided that they are perhaps going to push off the introduction of any U.S.-based or sponsored peace plan here uh, in the Middle East. And um, I would like to know from you, now that Israel is heading towards elections come April the 9th, is this a move specifically uh, based on U.S. interests? Is this President Trump doing the Prime Minister of Israel Bibi Netanyahu uh, a favor because as we know if we start negotiating now whatever the parameters are of the Trump plan it could have a an impact on Netanyahu's and the Likud's chances for uh, uh, for sustaining uh, a lot of Knesset seats of the Prime Minister being re-elected is is that the thinking is Prime Minister Trump on board with Prime Minister with sorry President Trump on board with Prime Minister Netanyahu to a point where he is willing to delay this as a result specifically to help Netanyahu, or perhaps it's just because of elections in general 
that the U.S. has decided to wait on this plan, which the president, by the way, said he would introduce by the end of 2018, and that did not happen. As far as the U.S. Uh, peace initiative, uh, my hope is that the architects of U.S. national security policy will uh, wake up to the idea that with all due respect to the Arab-Israeli conflict, to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, those are tumbleweeds, tumbleweeds uh, in face of the real stormy, uh, smothering st sandstorms threatening America's interest in the Middle East and uh, beyond. Uh, namely, uh, the U.S., in my mind, should focus on the Iranian threat, on the Sunni terrorism threat, on the Russian uh, encroachment into the, uh, the Middle East, the, the stability of uh, the Sisi regime in Egypt, the Hashemite regime in uh, Jordan, introducing uh, an American peace plan between Israel and the Palestinians at this stage would ignore the track record of all U.S. peace plans going back to the 1950s. All of them failed. Now, all of them were generated by very good intentions, but all of them failed because they faced uh, the reality of the Middle East. And the reality of the Middle East is that whenever the U.S. presents a peace initiative, it forces the Arabs to outflank that initiative from the more radical side, and therefore it adds fuels rather than water to the fire here in our, uh, in our region. Moreover, America's uh, uh, allies, Arab allies in the Middle East, certainly are way, way, way more concerned about the Ayatollah's machete at their throat than they are about a Palestinian-Israeli uh, initiative. And certainly, uh, the U.S. Uh, is aware to the fact that the only two successful peace initiatives have been initiated by the parties directly, Israel, Egypt, Israel, uh, Jordan. The U.S. played a major role in both those successful initiatives, but not as an initiator as a deal sealer, as a deal concluder, facilitating the two parties to conclude their own direct uh, initiative. And, uh, and I hope that when it comes to an initiative, it will focus on the Ayatollah's uh, threat rather than on the Palestinians. There are certain rumors coming out of Washington that there is an, a Netanyahu uh, Crown Prince Salman uh, meeting uh, around the corner, maybe within a few days, maybe within a few uh, weeks. Uh, my hope is that there will be such a meeting, but this meeting should again focus on the future of the House of Saud, on the future of Sheikh Khalifa in Bahrain, on the future and the survival of the current pro-American regimes in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, and, uh, and uh, Oman, and certainly bolstering the Hashemites in Jordan and Sisi in Egypt, not uh, uh, adding fuel to the Israeli-Palestinian fire, which with all due respect is in not even a junior league issue compared to the professional league issues of the real challenges facing America's national security in the Middle East today. Ambassador Eniger, we are out of time. I hope the listeners understand and fully appreciate, as I do, your insight into all of these issues, Israel-U.S. relations, the situation here in the Middle East. So I really want to thank you for your time. Ambassador Yoram Edinger, uh, consul, former Consul General, Southwest United States, Minister of Congressional Affairs at Israel's Embassy in Washington. And as you can obviously hear, an expert on U.S.-Israel relations and so many other things Middle East. Wishing you a wonderful day, a Shavuot Tov, a good Rosh Chodesh, Shvat, only good things. I appreciate your time coming back on the show. Thanks so much for your analysis. And thank you, and uh, thank you especially for your determined initiative to educate the public at large. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. You are listening to Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. My name is Josh Haston. We're going to take a quick break. 
Come back with so much more news. Situation down in Gaza. Rocket launched last night. We'll talk about it in just a minute. Don't forget, you can get in touch with me during the week. Josh at thelandofisrael.com. On Facebook, it's Joshua Haston. And on Twitter, at Josh Haston. Shout out to my main man, Benjamin Bresky, the in- Bresky engineer extraordinaire. Without him, we cannot get these shows done. And Tabitha Epstein as well, who works on our Land of Israel staff. Uh, thanks so much. And we'll take a short break. Don't go anywhere. Coming right back with the news. If you want to improve relations between Israel and American Jews, one of the things that you should do is encourage people to listen to the Land of Israel Network. Listen to Eve Harrow, and listen to Yishai Fleischer, and listen to Ari and Jeremy, and Shlomo Katz, and listen to Mike Foyer, and listen to Josh Haston, because the Land of Israel Network has a mission, and that's to spread love between Israel and American Jews. There's so much to love about Israel. There's so much to love about Israelis. And I think the Land of Israel Network is part of the solution. You are all part of the solution. You're listening to the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com, broadcasting the truth and beauty of Israel to the world. And we are back. Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored, on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. It is Monday, January the 7th, 2019. Time is flying when you're having fun. It is Rosh Chodesh Shvat. It snowed last night in Gush Etzion. Did you know this, Ben? Last night in the Gush, we had snow. It didn't stick to the ground, but we had for, I don't know, for about an hour or so, there was some snow. You can go to my Facebook page and see my car with a, uh, a layer of snow on it. It is amazing to have snow. It is really cold here in Israel today. I am in Jerusalem. This is Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Thanks again to Ambassador Yoram Edinger. That's insight, folks. You're just not getting uh, in the mainstream media. You're not getting it in many places. So I thank him for his time and for his insight and everything else going on here. Again, so as he mentioned, Trump, Trump's top aide, uh, John Bolton, was here actually caused a little bit of a uh, controversy. Well, it's really not controversial. I mean, who would think visiting the Western Wall would be such a big deal? But John Bolton visiting the old city of Jerusalem, the Western Wall, and he got a tour of the Western Wall tunnel, tunnels. This, of course, upsetting Saeb Arakat, the so-called Secretary General of the PLO, uh, denouncing the visit on Twitter. Nothing new there. Um, but it was nice to see John Bolton. He's a great friend of Israel. He's a great friend, as the ambassador mentioned, working to uh, rescind that uh, Zionism is racism clause there as when, when he was U.S. ambassador to the U.N. But Bolton images, you can see him uh, with Ambassador David Friedman, Ambassador Ron Dermer at the Kotel yesterday in the old city of Jerusalem. It was nice to see that. Now, last night, last night as I was sleeping about 3 a.m arabs in gaza hamas whomever launched a rocket towards the israeli coastal town of ashkelon the iron gnome defense system intercepted the rocket how did this all start and again remember it was only a matter of time before things heated up again on the gaza border yesterday uh, morning uh, hamas or one of the other terror gangs in gaza sent over some type of uh, bomb. I mean, that's what it, really what it was, uh, a bomb. It looked like it was in the shape of a drone attached to, I don't know, look like 50 or so balloons sent over it into Israel. It actually was a legitimate explosive device. Again, the goal is to murder Israeli children. Children are attracted by balloons. The hope is that a kid will see balloons in a field and run out and pick up the balloons and get killed. This is attempted murder. So Israel um, then took action and struck different targets throughout Gaza. And then, of course, as a result of that, well, not really as a result, that's the excuse, let's be clear, as the excuse um, to that, then Hamas launched a rocket. So they send over an incendiary device. Israel, of course, responds. And then Hamas blames Israel for responding and launches a rocket at about 3 a.m. The uh, Code Red app went off. I missed it. I was sound asleep on my phone. And the Iron Dome took out a rocket. We will have to see here today, Monday, if the situation down in the south escalates any further. But to anybody who thought there was a legitimate ceasefire or there'd be quiet down there, guess again. At the same time, Arab terrorists, uh, the night before last, this was a miracle. They fired at a bus 
at an Eged bus traveling in the area of Bet El. And you can see the pictures and the video on my Facebook page. Um, you see a bullet hole in the window to the left of the driver's seat and then, and then another one to the right. This is a true miracle. The driver sustained light wounds from the shrapnel of the bullets. Miracle, no doubt. Eged, of course, uh, very, very upset by the situation as more and more buses are being attacked by rocks and by here, in this case, a shooting attack. Um, Eged, I believe, uh, I don't know if it's still going on. I know Eged was planning a strike here uh, for this morning in certain areas as a result, demanding that their drivers and their passengers uh, be secure. I mean, I think that's a, um, a reasonable request, to put it mildly. I actually noticed on the way into Jerusalem today a substantial or significant IDF security presence on the roads, and I think it should be like that all the time. I know the IDF is operating 24-7, but today I actually saw, I, I believe, a more, uh, a more significant presence especially in places like uh, Tekoa and all these other places where there is daily daily rock attacks and firebomb attacks for those who thinks it's just a one-off or here and there I get messages from Hatzalah Yudava Shamron Hatzala Judea and Samaria also known as rescuers without borders I get their messages and it's between 10 and 20 different incidents each and every day. At the same time, Times of Israel reports that Israeli security forces on Friday night arrested a man, an Arab, whose two brothers have been implicated in two recent terror attacks, Mohammed Bargudi. This Bargudi tribe, I'm telling you, a lot of bad seeds in that Bargudi tribe, detained by troops in Kobar, a village near Ramallah, according to local media. Uh, IDF officials said that his brother, Asim, is suspected of carrying out a deadly attack um, at Givad Asaf on December the 13th. Uh, Arab media said Israeli forces threatened family members they could be deported to Jericho if they did not give up Asim within days. Now, I'm not sure what this deporta uh, deportation to Jericho would do in terms of creating a deterrence. It's probably an inconvenience to have to leave your town and move to a different city, but that's another town which is controlled by the PA. I say deport them out of the country, send a clear message, especially in these cases where we know that the family is involved in terror, deport the entire family, get them out of here, send a message that if you carry out an attack, if you aid and abet a terrorist who's a member of your family, um, you have the chance of being uh, deported. That should, be, that should be the threat. That, I believe, would create deterrence. Yet, at the same time, and I don't understand this, and this has happened many times before, I don't get it. Maybe you could help me explain this. I just don't get this at all. This year, reported by Israel National News, on Friday, the body of Rahman Abu Jamal, who carried out a stabbing attack at the police station in Armona Natsiv, about a month and a half ago, he was killed by, uh, I think, police or, or security forces as he tried to carry out the stabbing attack. His body was returned to his family this Friday afternoon. Why are we turning, re returning the bodies of terrorists? Why? All they do is they have mass funerals, even though they're not supposed to, mass rallies where they call for the destruction of the state of Israel. It incites and inspires the next generation that they too can die as a martyr in their view for carrying out murderous attacks or attempted attacks against Israelis. Why does Israel... Why is this a humanitarian gesture? This is an enabler. This is an, another tool used to incite the next generation, these funerals. Why do we turn over the terrorist body? I don't think we have any obligation to do so. I don't believe so. I don't think there's some kind of law. These are terrorists. This isn't even like, you know, in a war where you turn over bodies of, of the deceased of your, of your enemy. Um, this is an ongoing war of terror against the state of israel no reason to return the bodies in some good news the country of brazil plans to relocate its embassy to jerusalem taking a, a book out of uh, rather a page out of the book that's the expression of the united states uh, brazil plans to relocate relocate its embassy according to the jerusalem post from tel aviv to jerusalem the country's president Yair Bolsonaro confirmed in an interview with SBT Television on Thursday saying 
that more radical Arab nations will object to the move, but others will not. And he doesn't care because he's going to do it anyway, from what I understand. Well, the Prime Minister of Israel was just over there, a new, strong um, relationship forming with Brazil in light of the fact that the president, Bolsonaro, is a fan of the Jewish state and the Jewish people. We're not sure exactly. It says, his quote is, it's not a matter of uh, if they're going to move the embassy to Jerusalem. The question is when. So the Brazilians working out when they are, they are going to be, I believe, the third nation to move the embassy, as it should be, to our capital in Jerusalem. Egypt's president, in other news, uh, the president of Egypt, uh, Al-Sisi, was on CBS the other day. He gave this interview. I don't understand how this happens. He gave this interview, and then he actually asked that C, uh, 60 Minutes on CBS pull the interview. Why? I mean, I don't get it. I don't know why he would say some things and then have it asked to have it pulled, but he talked about military cooperation between Egypt and Israel, saying it's reached an unprecedented level in Sinai, where the Egyptians are battling ISIS terrorists. Now, Israel, he says, uh, has been helping out in this battle. Um, but for some reason, he, I guess he got cold feet. You wanted CBS to pull it. And I didn't watch the interview, but from what I understand, they certainly aired the interview with the head of um, the nation of Egypt. But, um, you know, there you see uh, more cooperation. Israel, of course, uh, sharing that 240-kilometer-long border. Israel built a security fence down there, not necessarily only for terrorists, but also uh, infiltrators who are, have been coming into the country over the last couple of years. According to foreign reports here, the Jerusalem Post says, the militaries of the two countries, Israel and Egypt, meet regularly to exchange intelligence in the fight against ISIS, and Cairo has given the green light to Jerusalem to strike the terrorists by air so there you have the relationship between even even though you still can call it a cold piece between israel and egypt and finally um one bds fail which i'd like to report on uh, the uk pink floyd tribute band was here in israel playing a show ben did you go to the show Yes, Ben was there. Ben Bresky was there. Let him let him tell you about it. Uh, let him come on the air and tell you about the UK Pink Floyd experience landing in Ben Gurion Airport Thursday night. I saw images of a lot of different pro-Israel advocates meeting them at the airport, thanking them for coming and playing in Israel because, of course, Roger Waters, the anti-Israel, anti-Semitic hater, BDS advocate, tried to encourage the UK Pink Floyd ban not to come and play in Israel. They did. There was a whole issue whether they were going to play his song, songs that Waters had a hand on. Apparently, they did not perform any songs that Roger Waters wrote. Another Brick in the Wall they didn't do, and Comfortably Numb, and some of the more well-known songs. But from what I hear, it was still a great show. And another BDS fail, those trying to boycott the state of Israel. It, you're losing. We just had 4 million tourists in 2018. UK Pink Floyd tribute band was here. Bon Jovi's coming back this summer. You haters are losing. You're causing a lot of, uh, you're making a lot of noise. That's for sure. But the BDS will not succeed. You guys are failing miserably. And more and more people are visiting the Jewish state of Israel. And with that, if you missed any part of the show, you can always go back and listen to it on demand, either on the landofisrael.com's website, on SoundCloud, on my Facebook page, on iTunes. A lot of ways you can get all of the wonderful programming and hear from all of the wonderful colleagues of mine, my fellow hosts here at the Land of Israel Network. Again, big shout out to Benjamin Bresky, Tabitha Epstein, and everyone at Land of Israel Nes Network. Uh, my name is Josh Haston for the 7th of January, 2019. Rosh Chodesh Shvat. Have a wonderful month. Tu B'Shvat, right around the corner. It does not feel like spring here. It is ice cold. It's about 3 degrees Celsius, at least it was this morning, which is about 30-something degrees Fahrenheit. And we had some snow again last night. I hope it keeps snowing. It's snowing in the north. The Hermon apparently is getting a ton of snow. Hopefully the ski season will be opening here in the days ahead. Uh, get in touch with me during the week, josh at thelandofisrael.com. On Facebook, it's Joshua Haston, and on Twitter, at Josh Haston. Most importantly, 
between now and when we speak again next Monday. Please, God, everyone, uh, everyone out there in the wonderful world of ours, be safe. Shalom, shalom from a cold and blistery but beautiful Jerusalem, eternal capital of the Jewish people. Shalom, shalom. Decision, says Paul Pillich, is a risk rooted in the courage of being free. Now, I'm feeling pretty free right now, and I've got the courage to take some risks because I've made a decision. This is the last episode of Season 2. I'm Rav Mike Foyer, and this is The Jewish Story. Join Rav Mike Foyer for the best Jewish history podcast, The Jewish Story, on the Land of Israel Network.